Good morning. Uh, Iran has shot down an American drone. This is Thursday, June the 20th, and this is the drill. And thank you very much. My name is Ronald T. Hardgrove. This is my podcast called The Drill. It's about being a true conservative and the difference between being a true conservative and being a reactionary. Uh, It's about what true conservatism is and why it matters. My podcast is made possible by Spreakerbot.com and it can be heard on iTunes, uh, Spotify, among others. My email address is storytimes at hotmail.com and I'm on Twitter at Ronald Hardgrove and on Facebook at The Drill. Uh, I started my socio-political odyssey as a conservative Republican. I knew that I was a conservative Republican because of where I stood on the issues. Although I knew I was right, I felt as though I was losing all the arguments. And not just me, but all other Republicans seem to be losing as well. And if I know that I'm right but feel like I'm losing the argument, then something is wrong. It was then that I decided to investigate the liberal conservative dynamic. And after two decades of study, I've concluded the following, that being a true conservative is knowing that the essence of any argument is change. Where you stand on change is where you stand politically. If it ain't broke, don't fix it is realistic and conservative. And if it ain't broke, break it is idealistic and socialist. My position on the issues is irrelevant. Political identity is based on philosophical reality. What is it that's being conserved beside the status quo? Individuality. True conservatives are concerned with the individual and liberals slash socialists are concerned with groups. However, the rights enumerated in the Constitution are individual, not uh, group. So in other words, that they're about Uh, Not about human rights, white rights, men's rights, straight rights, but about individual rights. True conservative thinks as an individual for and about individuals. By conceding the concept we, the reactionary, allows himself to be trapped into groupthink, inadvertently promoting the very thing that he claims to despise, a bloated, overreaching bureaucracy. As a result, the left appears to win again and again. A word about the left. In reality, they have no authority, no power. They can't win. The only reason that they appear to win is that reactionaries give them their victories. Reactionaries, especially talk show hosts, aid and abet the left. The biggest mistake that so-called conservative talk show hosts make is being reactionary. Being reactionary is an anti-conceptual mentality that involves reacting to arbitrary claims and aping the left. Arbitrary claims are those claims that lack evidence or proof. And aping the left means copying their communication style, which means making predictions and using anti-concepts. Making predictions deprives conservatives of values by substituting forecasting for moralizing. Moralizing involves judgment. Judgment is used to decide ultimately what is real and what is imaginary. We use judgment instead of prediction because we need to answer the question, what should I do? Not what is going to happen. Using anti-concepts aids the left in obliterating legitimate concepts, such as property and conflict of interest. The second biggest mistake pundits make is in confusing traditionalism with conservatism. Traditionalism demands a slavish devotion to the status quo. Traditionalism is a mistake because it is as idealistic as socialism. The socialist tells himself, if only we could get rid of the status quo, we'd be all set. The traditionalist tells himself, if only we could get rid of change, we'd be all set. The conservative asks himself, should we change? If it is true that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then right-wing pundits do more to honor the left than to defeat it. So uh, that is my introduction um, to my podcast. And uh, right now I want to go to the uh, Tales of the Dervishes, Idris Shah, except instead of going uh, reading what I normally read, which is the When the Waters Were Changed, I'm going to read another chapter called 
uh, the three truths. Uh, the Sufis are known as seekers of the truth, this truth being a knowledge of objective reality. An ignorant and covetous tyrant once demanded to possess himself of this truth. He was called Rodarig, a great lord of Mercia in Spain. He decided that truth was something which Omar el Alawi of Tarragona could be forced to tell him. Omar was arrested and brought to the court. Rudarig said, I have ordered that the truths which you are to uh, which you know are to be told to me in words which I understand. Otherwise, your life is forfeit. Omar answered, Do you deserve in this chivalric court to the uh, do you observe in this chivalric court the universal custom whereby if an arrested person tells the truth in answer to a question and that truth does not inculpate him, he is released to freedom? That is so, said the Lord. I call upon all of you here present to witness this by the honor of our Lord, said Omar, and I will now tell you not one truth, but three. We must also be satisfied, said Rudarig, that what you claim to be these truths are in fact truth. The proof must accompany the telling. For such a Lord as you, said Omar, to whom we can give not one truth but three, we can also give truths which will be self-evident. Rodarig preened himself at this compliment. The first truth, said the Sufi, is, I am he who is called Omar the Sufi of Tarragona. The second is that you have agreed to release me if I tell the truth. The third is that you wish to know the truth as you conceive it. Such was the impression caused by these words that the tyrant was compelled to give the dervish his freedom. And I like that uh, story because it deals with uh, lots of things that the left doesn't like. Uh, First of all is um, truth. And that the truth is um, defined as knowledge of objective reality. Objective reality, by the way, is redundant. Uh, It should be just knowledge of reality reality. Uh, Subjective reality is a contradiction. Objective reality is redundant. But anyway, so uh, the other part of this was talking about truth, the truth that he was going to be giving as self-evident, i.e. axiomatic, another uh, thing that the left likes to uh, deny or pretend doesn't exist. So um, I'll be back in a minute with uh, some comment about uh, the uh, situation with Iran and uh, other things from the Washington Times. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. The um, I heard uh, this morning on uh, from Hugh Hewitt that um, Iran has shot down one of our drones. Uh, They claim that it entered um, Iranian airspace. Um, American um, officials say uh, deny that, say that it was not, and that it was uh, shot down um, unprovoked. And um, it's been described, at least by Hugh Hewitt, as an act of war. And... um, One of the things that I wanted to say was that in a situation like this, we've gotten into the habit because of the left, where the left will say, well, you can't really trust anybody to know the truth. Everybody has certain biases and they have their, uh, everything is subjective. And so that, what that means is that when somebody's telling you, relating events to you, they're going to tell you those events in, um, the, in a manner that is most flattering to them. So in this particular case, the American government, the Iranians come out and say that the um, missile or the, the drone was in their airspace. American government says that the drone was uh, not in their airspace. The left would tell you we can't know who's right and uh, who's wrong, who's telling the truth or who's lying. The only thing we can do is look at things like, do we want to go to war? And uh, so then the answer is no, we don't want to go to war. So that's the direction we go is to try to do what we can to prevent a war. The, uh, they're wrong about this. We make the presumption for the status quo. And what that means is that we make the presumption for the truth of our, that our, gov- uh, of our government. Our government is telling the truth. And since you can't have 
it both ways, where the drone is both in their airspace and not in their airspace, then uh, Iran must therefore be lying. Therefore, the attack was unprovoked, and um, also, I agree, an act of war. Uh, part of the problem that we have here with the, the act of war situation is that uh, nobody wants, no president wants to declare war anymore. They will uh, conduct military operations. Um, what, what's called the war on terrorism is really not a war at all. It's a series of military operations. Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Desert Storm, uh, Operation Desert Shield, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we don't get into actual declared wars like we should. Uh, Sean Hannity is wrong on this issue. He says that there's nothing in the Constitution that prevents the, the government from conspiring, uh, two branches of government from conspiring with each other to avoid um, declaring war before they commit troops to battle. And it's just simply wrong. The, the Constitution is a, a document that limits the government. It says this is, especially the federal government, says this is it as far as the federal government is concerned. This is what the federal government can do and nothing else. So if we want to give extra powers to uh, the federal government, it has to be done uh, via constitutional amendment. So, And in the Constitution, the, uh, the two branches of government, uh, the executive and the legislative, have no authority to uh, circumvent or... Um, otherwise uh, go around the Constitution to commit tr uh, troops to battle or to um, use force, international force, and um, uh, without getting a declaration of war. So, um, but in any, so in any case, uh, as far as whether or not we should declare war on uh, the Iranians, I think it should be the last option. I think the first thing, of course, to do is uh, various diplomatic uh, efforts and uh, make demands for the, the Iranians to uh, pay us for the damage that was done um, and um, uh, you know talk to their diplomat, whoever their person is in Washington, and uh, register our complaints with them and perhaps with other international bodies. And then as things, if things escalate, then as things go along, we can look at uh, f uh, finally getting to the point where we have to uh, go to the American people and ask for a declaration of war. Because it does look like the Iran is going to be uh, provocative and that they're going to do whatever they can to um, provoke um, confrontation and, uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East and to try to do it on their terms. So um, another, what else we got here in the issues in the, um, uh, whoops, we're re, there we go, the peace cross can stay, Supreme Court rules. So the, uh, there's a peace cross that is in, uh, on the East Coast somewhere, and um, it's a cross that was dedicated to uh, the fallen of World War One, those that those uh, individuals that um, were uh, the unknown so soldiers that uh, were killed and never recovered in World War One, and it's a big Christian cross and has the uh, the names or some kind of inscription on it. And so there was a suit by the ACLU. That's uh, in Maryland. That's where it is. It's a forty foot Maryland cross. Um, dedicated to World War I soldiers. And so the Supreme Court ruled Thursday that uh, Bladensburg's beloved World War I Memorial Cross can remain on public lands, rejecting a challenge that it was illegal entanglement of state and religion. The court in a 7-2 decision ruled that while the cross is a Christian symbol, the one in Bladensburg has, quote, special significance, unquote, as a war memorial and expression of the community's grief at its lost sons. Justice Samuel A. Alito Jr. said that removing it at this point would actually be seen as, quote, hostility, unquote, toward religion. Quote, the religion clauses of the Constitution aim to foster a society in which people of all beliefs can live, live together harmoniously, and the presence of the Bladensburg Cross on the land where it has stood for so many years is fully consistent with that aim, unquote, he wrote. The 32-foot-tall uh, Latin cross stands at the intersection of several major roads in the suburbs just outside of Washington, D.C. 
It was erected by the American Legion, and the design was chosen to mirror the crosses that stood on the graves of troops who died during the Great War. The names of 49 soldiers are engraved at the base of the cross. So, um, I uh, am in agreement with the uh, court's decision that I think that the ACLU has uh, gone overboard in the uh, religious, uh, in the area of um, a link between government and religion. That if there's any type of religious iconography anywhere in a building, then it, the government must be seen to be promoting a particular religion over uh, other religions, and that somehow this is going to affect um, everybody's uh, freedom uh, to practice the religion that they uh, so choose. And uh, it's um, I, ridiculous on its face. And I'm glad that the Supreme Court has seen that and um, has uh, gone ahead and made the uh, and made the decision that it did. Seven to two. I don't know who, and I'm not all that really that interested in who it is that was the dissenters. Let's see. Uh, let's see. What is this one? Now I'm into the uh, editorials of the Washington Times, and let's see what we got here. Uh, there. Uh, let's try this one. A bad idea exiled again. Let's see what the uh, what this is about. It's rather um, cryptic. Uh, there are eternal debates about issues that, while seeming, and it's by the Washington Times, so it's an analysis opinion by uh, the Times um, editorial board. There are eternal debates about issues that, while seeming adjudicated and settled, nonetheless bubble up every few years. Should Pete Rose be in the Baseball Hall of Fame? Who killed John F. Kennedy? Should there be a constitutional amendment proscribing the burning of the American flag? Flag question bubbled up again the other day when President Trump announced that he supports the idea of mayhem for flag burners. Quote, all in for Senator Steve Daines as he proposes an amendment for a strong ban on burning our American flag, unquote, the president tweeted. Quote, a no-brainer, unquote. Senator Daines, a Republican of Montana, introduced legislation on Flag Day to restore, quote, Congress's constitutional authority to ban the desecration of the United States flag, unquote. The president has been particularly vehement on the issue for years. Quote, nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, unquote. He tweeted in 2016. Quote, perhaps loss of citizenship or a year in jail, unquote. Flag burning was popular in certain neighborhoods in the 60s, that decade when and where so many bad and silly things originated. By 1989, all but two of the states had some kind of law in the books banning flag burning. But then came Texas v. Johnson in the U.S. Supreme Court, and down they all went. The high court examining the criminal conviction of a man for burning a flag at the Republican National Convention in 1984 in Dallas found that such laws violated the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees a right to free speech. Among those voting to eliminate flag-burning laws was the late Anton Scalia, patron saint of conservative jurists and other devotees of the Constitution. The decision was clearly the right one. The urge to slap a flag burner is also clearly understandable. Flag burning is silly, immature, and plainly idiotic, and to most Americans, downright offensive, like loud rock music. But the point of free speech protection is to protect precisely that speech that many are offended by. Free speech just for congenial speech is no free speech guarantee at all. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh has indicated that he backs the 89 decision. So too is John Roberts, the Chief Justice, who was appointed to the court by President George W. Bush. Calls for bans on flag burning are usually exercises in pandering by cynical politicians who should, and usually do, know better. Hillary Clinton, a lawyer representing her adoptive state of New York in the U.S. Senate, co-sponsored the Flag Protection Act of 2005. The law would have imposed a year in prison and a fine of up to $100,000 for, quote, destroying or damaging a U.S. flag with the primary purpose and intent to incite or produce imminent violence or a breach of the peace, intentionally threatening or intimidating any person or group of persons by burning a U.S. flag, or stealing or knowingly converting the use of a U.S. flag belonging to the United States or belonging to another person on U.S. lands and intentionally destroying or damaging that flag, unquote. Mrs. Clinton was looking ahead to the 2008 presidential rates and looking for an opportunity to prove her patriotic bona fides. The 
proposed law was a law, not a constitutional amendment, and she knew the man she lived with had been a lecturer in constitutional law at the University of Arkansas, that if her bill had become law, it would have been invalidated by the Supreme Court. Senator Daines' bill is uh, at least proposed as an amendment, but with a presidential blessing or not, has been exiled to the island of lost luggage and failed legislation. The island is officially called a committee. Justice Scalia said it best, as he often did. Quote, if it were up to me, I'd put in jail every sandal-wearing, scruffy-bearded weirdo who burns the American flag, but I am not king, unquote. The only king we have is the Constitution, which protects the right of Americans to say what they please, even when their speech reveals them to be idiots and not even useful idiots at that. Um, they're right about the fact that uh, it is, a, at least in part, a free speech issue. What they're missing is the fact that this is also a property issue. As libertarians have correctly pointed out, there's no such thing as the flag. It doesn't exist. Okay, all you have is property. So if I go out and I buy a flag, it's my flag. It belongs to me. And I get to do with my property as I see fit. If I want to tear it up, if I want to stomp on it, if I want to burn it, if I want to throw it in the trash, if I want to shred it, I get to do that because it's my property. So um, it, it, not just, again, the um, free speech angle on this, but it is also a property rights issue. And I wish the Supreme Court uh, had noted that. So um, where are we here? Uh, back in a minute. Thank you very much. So um, uh, I was listening not only, uh, first I listened to um, Hugh Hewitt and then to um, Glenn Beck. And Glenn Beck was talking this morning and played a clip of a, um, a interaction, a fighting, infighting between um, Joy Behar and um, Megan McCain. And uh, so they get into this big brouhaha. I forget exactly what it was about. But um, the uh, Hugh, or, um, Glenn Beck expressed some sympathy for uh, Miss McCain. And what was interesting is that because um, her and Joy Behar go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, talking over each other a lot. So you can tell what really what either one of them was saying. Then uh, Whoopi Goldberg stepped in. And she tried to smooth the waters. And Megan McCain came back and said, hey, to, to Whoopi Goldberg, don't feel sorry for me. I get paid to do this. And I think that was something that uh, Glenn Beck didn't listen to or pay attention to because he said, he came out and said he, he felt sorry for her, that she's got to go in and put up with this kind of crap each and every day. Or that she was some kind of a trooper, you know, a quasi-heroic figure for having to go in and, and put up with this every day. And uh, she gets what she deserves. This is the truth. She knew what she was getting into. She's paid, uh, and she knew what she was getting into. I wouldn't do it. She's stupid for doing it. She's wrong for doing it. Uh, but again, you want to go ahead and uh, get paid to uh, get savaged by pit bulls or, or something of that nature... Then, as my grandmother says, you get exactly what you deserve. And uh, Megan McCain has got it coming because, again, um, she knew what she was getting into when uh, she uh, got onto the show. And also, I think that it is a bad idea for her and for uh, Glenn Beck from the standpoint that all she's doing is helping to promote uh, Joy Behar, Whoopi Goldberg. She's not out uh, striking a blow to help uh, promotes republicanism and Glenn Beck isn't doing himself or conservatives any favors by playing the clip all he's doing is advertising the show and helping to give boost their ratings shame on him for doing that so uh, back in a minute
Thank you very much. So I'm going to read the conclusion of the um, chapter in Bullies by uh, how bullies uh, in the the left's culture of fear and intimidation silences Americans. And uh, the last uh, one that we had was, uh, because he talked about various uh, bullies uh, and uh, university bullies, and the last one was Hollywood bullies. So this is the conclusion where he wraps it up. All of these bullies act as a phalanx, targeting their opposition for destruction, and their bullying works. It works so well, in fact, that even the most untouchable people in institutions feel the wrath of their thuggishness. Take, for example, Obamacare. Now, for years, the media in Hollywood had coordinated to attack the American health care system. Movies like John Q. suggested that America's health care system was massively discriminatory and required vigilante justice to set it straight. Every television show seemed to focus on some poor sap who lost his house because grandma needed dialysis. The media, meanwhile, covered every bankruptcy, uh, every sob story from every person who developed a disease and didn't get proper insurance. This isn't to say that America's health system is perfect. It isn't. But by the time Barack Obama came to office, many Americans were under the impression that the American health care system was worse than Zimbabwe's rather than recognizing the fact that America's life expectancy rate after cancer diagnosis was the best on the planet, rather than seeing the American surgeons set the global standard, rather than understanding that America is the global leader in research and development in the medical field, and most of all, rather than spotting the obvious truth that over-regulation and over-suing of the medical industry has set up a thicket of red tape, raising costs, and lowering quality of care. The media in Hollywood portrayed America's health care system as a paragon of failure. Not only that, they suggested that the failure was due to capitalism, not the, the uh, forest of legal nonsense set up by well-meaning politicians and politicians who'd been paid off. By the time Obama took office, the ground was prepped. Obama promptly called a faux groundswell in favor of, created a faux groundswell in favor of complete overhaul of the health care system in America. Nobody demanded it. In fact, most Americans wanted Obama focused on the economy. Mitt Romney ripped Obama for his failure to focus. Uh, Let's see. Um, Okay, but with the help of his friends, with the help of the folks at places like Center for American Progress and his friends in the media and his friends in Hollywood, Obama did what he wanted to do. He bullied the Tea Party. He suggested they were racist. He tore apart the insurance companies. He denounced them as greedy. He rammed his health care plan down the throat of Americans. And Americans did what they wanted to do. They booted Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats from their purchase of power in Congress in response. That's when the most shocking bullying of all began. See, there was one little problem with President Obama's health care plan. It was blatantly unconstitutional. The Constitution of the United States does not allow the federal government to force people to buy health insurance as Obamacare mandated. Certain specific taxes were okay under the Constitution, but this wasn't one of them. And the Supreme Court majority knew it. That majority was composed of five justices, Justice Alito, Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, uh, and Roberts. Uh, Well, no, Roberts and the swing voter, Justice Kennedy. All five of those justices were expected expected to vote to strike down the so-called Obamacare individual mandate. They were expected to strike down the law as a whole. They were expected to strike it down because it was one of the worst violations of individual liberty in American history. The federal government was claiming the authority to punish you for failing to buy something they wanted you to buy. Instead, in a shocking turn of events, Chief Justice John Roberts, an appointee of George Bush, voted with the liberals on the court to uphold Obamacare in its entirety. This was no surprise to me. I'd opposed Roberts' nomination all the way back in 2005, but it was a surprise to virtually everyone else, mainly because Roberts had clearly signaled during oral arguments that he was against the Obamacare mandate. Now he ruled that the mandate wasn't actually a mandate, it was a tax. As a tax, said Roberts, it was constitutional. As a mandate, it wasn't. Therefore, it was constitutional. This was, to put it bluntly, the worst kind of bull crap ever put on Supreme Court paper. As it turned out, Chief Justice Roberts had switched his vote. He didn't switch his vote because he suddenly discovered a new legal theory that knocked his socks off. He did it because of external pressure. As CBS News observed, approvingly, 
Quote, Robert pays attention to media coverage. As Chief Justice, he's keenly aware of his leadership role on the court. He is also sensitive to how the court is perceived by the public. There are countless news articles in May warning of damage to the court and to Robert's reputation if the court were to strike down the mandate. President Obama himself led the bullying charge, stating in early April 2012 that if the Supreme Court saw fit to overturn his signature legislation, it would be unprecedented. Ultimately, I'm confident that the Supreme Court will not take what would be an unprecedented, extraordinary step of overturning a law that was passed by a strong majority of democratically elected Congress. He blathered, his ears quivering with rage, and Roberts caved. Now the, the, now, the Supreme Court of the United States is supposed to be free of politics. That's why these legalistic doofuses in silly-looking robes get a lifetime appointment and a free supply of arrogance to go with it. They're not supposed to be susceptible to bullying. Upholding the Constitution is supposed to be a bully-free job. Clearly, it wasn't, and the American people paid the price. And I'm going to leave it there, because I have a couple of comments I want to make uh, on this one. Um, first of all, uh, when he's talking about that they're appointed for life. Nobody's appointed to anything for life. Nobody serves in the United States, in the government of the United States of America for life. They don't. There's no such thing. Supreme Court justices do not have to be reconfirmed as appellate court justices do. Appellate court justices serve for a certain term, then they have to be reconfirmed. So the uh, Supreme Court justices can be removed from office, but they must be impeached, just like the president, in order to be removed from office. So uh, this whole idea that they're they're untouchable is crap. Um, If you want them gone, Justice Roberts, um, if this is as big of a deal as the author claims, the biggest ripoff of individual liberty in American history, then Roberts should be getting impeached. Period. End of statement. Uh, in the beginning of this, uh, let's see, they're saying uh, coordinated attack the health care system. Um, let's see, where, where were we? Let's see, America's health system. Oh, there it is. This isn't to say that America's health system is perfect. It isn't. It's not a system. And this is where uh, Republicans go wrong. Words matter. Concepts matter. And the concept, there's a big difference between the concept of a system and the concept of a market. If you talk about the healthcare as being part of a system, then everything psychologically has a tendency to move in the direction of government control. Then you're just simply arguing about how much government control you're going to have rather than whether or not to have government control. Whereas if you're, the argument is about a market, the dynamic, the psychological dynamic is the other direction. We're presuming for individual liberty and individual freedom and forcing our opponents to make the case for change. Because that's what the, our opponents want. They want a health care system. They don't have it at present time. We still have a health care market. It's kind of uh, rickety and teetering, but it's still there. And Republicans and conservatives must refer to it as a market. Until we get to a single-payer system where the federal government is paying everybody's bills, it's still a market. And it must be referred to that way. Uh, Again, uh, as, as a matter of reality and as a matter of psychology. So um, let's see what we got here. There it is. Who are the true conservatives? They are the people that understand that conservatism is a lifestyle. They're patriotic people who use common sense. They make judgments instead of predictions, speak clearly and definitively, and are not afraid to say no. They are open-minded, asking why rather than why not. They are consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of their existence, unafraid to learn or correct their mistakes. They are normal Americans. And that brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, thank you very much for listening, and have a great day.